Man, you ought to stop, just slow down sometime and really think about that. That God became a man. He must think a lot about the potential of who he can be inside of men. If he died for man, if he had to become a man to die to restore man back, he must think a lot of that potential. My whole life growing up, I was told that Jesus died on the cross because I was a sinner. And it left me a forgiven sinner. Nobody ever told me that he died on the cross to restore my purpose and potential and destiny. That he actually died on the cross because he saw great value in what I could be when he lived inside of me. Of course he had to die because I sinned. But he didn't die because I was a sinner. He died because I was a lost son. See, the cross doesn't expose your sin. It removes your sin to expose your potential and your value. But my whole life I was taught a sin-conscious gospel. That preyed on my depravity to try to get me to say I'm sorry. The goodness of God leads men to change. You don't, you don't have to come at somebody's depravity. You teach what they're called to be and created to be. And the goodness of God gets into you and brings change to you. Yeah? I've never seen one scripture in my Bible, reading my Bible. And I've read my Bible. I've never seen a scripture that said the reprimand of God is what changes a man's life. People always say, well, it ain't all about the love of God. It's about the judgment of God, too. I've never seen the judgment of God transform a life. He did not come into the world to condemn the world. That's the same word as judge, to, to give the world what it deserves. He did not. He came into the world that the world might be through him, might be saved. In John 12, he said, I did not come to judge you. I came that you might be saved, but you'll have my word that will judge you in that day. Remember when he comes, there'll be a sword in his mouth, the word of the Lord. He didn't come to judge you. He came to save you. The cross tells you who you're called and created to be. Never forget that the cross does not expose your sin. It removes your sin to expose and unlock your potential, your value and your purpose. There's no one out there that's ever went to a car lot and saw a used car for 10 5 and went to the dealer and said, you know what, I'll give you 15 Why? It's not worth it. It's worth 10 5 and you're going to try to get him down to 8 2 Who's ever went on a lot and said, I'll give you 15 if it's marked 10 5 Why? It's not worth it. But he shed his blood for you and me. And you think for a second I'm going to live condemned and feel unworthy. He washed my past away. He put a new thing inside of me. A new heart. New spirit. He put his kingdom in me. I didn't find a way to sin and get away with it. I found a way to be free. I found a way to wake up in him. And enjoy him. And him enjoy me. And be excited in life. The joy of my salvation. Not the joy of my circumstances, the joy of my salvation. Good tidings of. Good tidings of. That means the good tidings bring the great joy. Good tidings of. So when you understand the good tidings, great joy is the automatic response. So if you don't have great joy... You don't need a spirit of joy and you don't need an altar call where everybody's laughing, praying for you, hoping you get it. It's understand the good news. Because it's good tidings of. People say, how can you always be so the way you are? It's good tidings. <laughs> it's not going to change. That truth's not going to change. Tomorrow when I wake up, this gospel's going to be the same. When I crack open my Bible, he's going to love me. Oh, my goodness. And I'm going to be right in the sight of God. <laughs> when I go to bed tonight, I have total access to him. That will never change. Let me get a little strange and weird with you. A million years from now, he's not going to call on a loudspeaker, Dan Moeller, to the front. And say, you know, I've been thinking for a long time. I think I made a mistake when I let you in here. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. It's already settled, like already won. 
<laughs> so I might as well just become what he paid for. I might as well enjoy the ride and walk in a manner worthy of him and love him with my life. Since he loved me with his. I ought to just give it back, huh? And say, go ahead and take it. This is what you paid for. Not my worship. Not my tithe. He paid for my life. So go ahead and take it. Yeah? Man, I feel good about that. You feel good about that? So listen, guilt, condemnation, and shame is a lie from hell. It's never the gospel. Godly sorrow, repentance, feeling sorry for where you've been and what you've done and going, whoa. And letting the Holy Spirit bring that where you realize, whoa, and you run to God, not run from God. When you run from God, that's Adam in the garden. That's naked. That's ashamed. When you run to God, that's clothed and robed in righteousness. You run to God, you talk to God, you tell Him, wow, thank you for the conviction in my life, the truth you're working in me. I realize that is so not who you created me to be. Lord God, I don't want that in my life. You didn't create me for that. And I just thank you for loving me. Thank you for washing me. Thank you for forgiving me. When you're asking for forgiveness, you're wondering if you're forgiven. When you thank Him for forgiving you, you can move on. Yeah? Yeah. Come on, the blood of Jesus is speaking better things. This thing's not complicated. Like, he he didn't curse his son on the cross. He made his son to be sin. He cursed sin in the flesh. Sin shall have no dominion over you. You're not under the law. You're under grace. Shall we keep on sinning so we receive grace since we're not under the law? Absolutely not. He said, how can you who died to sin live in it any longer? See, the Christian life isn't praying a prayer to go to heaven. It's dying to your old life, and it's dying to sin once and for all so you can live to God. What that means is dying to its, its actions, its memories, its stain, its sting. And you wake up every day, and you don't believe your sin waiting to happen. That's not humble. That's deception. You're a son in the making. You're a daughter being manifested. You're growing up into him in all things. If you wake up and you're sin waiting to happen, you're constantly sin conscious and that's your tree and that's your fruit and you'll never repent because that's what we are and it's a wonder he loves us. And then the gospel remains a mystery that never transforms your life. One of the biggest mistakes we make, we think our ability to sin makes us sinners. So we say that in a false humility. And continue to do the same. Because it's what we believe we are. I didn't wake up to fail today. And that's not arrogance. I woke up to trust him and believe his grace. And I woke up to follow him and be formed in him and be more like him. I didn't wake up to be loved by you. I woke up to love you. So now you can't hurt me or let me down. Because my hope isn't in you. My hope comes from him. I, I, my expectations from the Lord. Yeah? So that empowers me to get in a big setting like this and rub elbows and not be in there for the wrong reasons. Not to try to find identity for what God's doing among us or through me, but to find identity through Him. Yeah? And then that brings really healthy relationship. So all of a sudden I can have something healthy with you. You guys good? I'm not even sure where we're heading. I guess I'm just feeling it out. I don't even know, but the gospel's amazing. I'm just thinking about God putting himself in the womb of a woman. It freaks me out to this day that that God would let Holy Spirit, the Son of God, Jesus, would say, okay, I'm ready to go. Put me in her. It had to happen. Like, he was Jesus just a second ago, son of God in the heavens, probably racing Michael and Gabriel around on the chariot. I don't know. But he was the Lord. And the next moment, he's a little embryo, a fetus, whatever he started out to be. He was in her womb, and there was a little heart beating, and he was a man. Freaks me out that God would become a man to rescue men. Never change his mind about what he created us to be. Never let where we weren't decide who he is, but let who he is decide where we can be. Come on, it's the goodness of God. It's the gospel. It's good news. It's amazing news. 
It's not, well, you've been wretched and sinners and you need to shape up. It's you're so much more. Would you open your eyes and see that God sees a whole lot more about us than we've ever considered. And it's time to stop talking ourselves down in a false humility and come up hither. Get your mind off the earth and set your mind in heaven where he's sitting, where you're seated with him at the right hand of Almighty God. Come on, that's all scripture. That's all scripture. I, I've been bought with a price. I'm not my own. I'm not going to sell cheap. I'm not for sale. Man, I got this thing over my head. No vacancy. Fully and completely occupied. Yeah? <laughs> Oh, man, I'm sorry, but I just feel a little passionate right now. <laughs> feel a little aggressive. Amen. The God of the universe. Nothing was made that wasn't made through him. He was there from the beginning. His name above every name. He's the Lord. He put himself in a woman to become a man. Well, yeah, but brother, he was 100% God. Stop. He came as a man. You're not doing him injustice when you say that. He said he's the son of man. He wants you to see he came as a man. Does God ever slumber? Where was Jesus in the boat? He was what? He was sleeping? But God doesn't slumber. Oh, so he came as a man. Can you tempt God? How come Jesus was tempted then at all points yet without sin? Because if he didn't come as a man and couldn't be tempted, it wouldn't be a real test. How God, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Is God already anointed? then why'd God have to anoint Jesus if he came as God? He came as a man. And he laid down his glory and he made himself of no reputation. Guess what we've sought our whole lives. Guess what a big dangerous trap is even in the church. It's people trying to seek reputation and get to be noticed. Sometimes it's dangerous to have a microphone because you need one. And you want to manifest be very careful. Have the same mind in you, Philippians 2. Have the same mind in you that was in him. Who even though he was considered equal with God, didn't consider it something to be acknowledged for. But instead laid down his glory and made himself of no reputation and became a bondservant to men. Even a servant to the point of death. Therefore... God has exalted him. Whew, you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, he will lift up that humility. Because he can flow through humility. Yeah. <laughs> Man, the gospel's exciting to me. You know what's freaking me out? He came as a man. In the womb of a woman, hung out in her birth, in her womb, and came through her birth canal, guys. The king of the universe was sitting in there for nine months, crockpotting in a woman. It freaks me out. It freaks me out. He did not pop into the wilderness at age 30, buffed and ready to roll. He didn't take a shortcut. He came as we came. Woman came from man, and every man since then came from woman. So he had to come through Mary. He had to come as a man. When he raised from the dead, he said, don't you be afraid. You touch me for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as I. What's he saying after he's raised from the dead? He's still a man. You better understand that and why. Because he's at the right hand of God and his blood's on the mercy seat. And he's sitting on his blood on the mercy seat at the right hand representing man as a man. Is he Lord? Yes. Is he God? Yes. Is he name above every name? Yes. 
But he's a man. He has a body. And the blood of a man is in the holy place. Crying out on behalf of men. Mercy. Speaking better things. <laughs> you better understand this stuff. It's powerful. It's innocent holy blood. Speaking out on behalf of guilty lives that would humble themselves and say, oops, what was I thinking? I've been living for me and I've been created for his image and his glory. Oops, what was I thinking? I've been trying to make life work for me. I'm bringing glory to his name now. I'm making change. I'm repenting. I'm turning around. Come on, this thing is simple. It's not just beneficial. You're not just getting blessings. He's not just setting you up for the future, making sure IRA works and your 401k is good. It's not why you're on the planet. You're on the planet to shine. You're on the planet to shine. And if we're his go-to people to be the light of the world, and this battery's dead or this light don't work, well, then there's darkness. So arise, shine, church. Your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen, and it's upon you. Oh, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the light, it's on you. <laughs> yeah. So let your light so shine before men. It doesn't say, so get discouraged, get disheartened, call for prayer, and need ministry. It says, let your light so shine. Get a perspective that guards your heart and keeps your heart because out of your heart flows the issues of life. Get a healthy reason for being and wake up every day in that reason. Put stickers and notes all over your house and on your mirror if you have to, but write out why you're alive and why you woke up so you never allow the flesh to have a voice. Because if you live by the Spirit, you will not, you will not, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. What's religion do with a scripture like that? If you live by the Spirit, Romans 8, it's there. You will not fulfill the lusts. Well, nobody's perfect, brother. Maybe you aren't even humble enough to hear scripture to even think about what he's trying to say. Maybe we're too fixed on just talking ourselves down, thinking it's humility when in fact it's deception. If you live in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. He's not talking about never making a mistake. He's not talking about just all of a sudden reacting in something. He's talking about the lusts and desires and the things that pull men from truth. Yeah? And then those people that do that get grayed out, get condemned, question themselves, question their own heart. A veil slips over their face and now they don't have intimacy with God so they can't get pregnant and reproduce a thing. Because they can't be with him because they don't feel close to him and they don't feel worthy of him. And, and yet here's the blood speaking better things, calling you in, wants to wash you clean. Are you with me? Guilt, condemnation, and shame. Three major tools of the devil. Do you have to be sorry for your sins? Is there a place of repentance for the gospel? You better believe it. There's some strange movements out there right now. Be very careful. There's some that say repentance is works and you don't have to. It's already finished and nobody needs to even get saved because the blood's speaking and everybody's already saved and don't know it. Stay away from the weird stuff. There's a lot of weird stuff out there. There's stuff out there that says, hey, we're always going to do what we're going to do. God knew that when he sent his son, and he knows it now. That's why he shed his blood to just cover us while we're out there living our way. His grace is sufficient. Grace is his working power to transform. When you preach grace apart from transformation, you're preaching perversion. Grace doesn't allow you to live in the flesh. Grace changes you. You say, oh my goodness, I really blew up on my wife today. Thank God for the grace of God. The grace of God empowers you to not blow up on her. The 
grace of God is God's power. It's His power on your behalf. It's His working ability to help make you what you could never be on your own. You're saved by grace, by His working power through your faith. You believe your life's worthy, that you have potential and destiny. And even though you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, He hasn't lost sight of your purpose and why you're here and He loves you. And you're saved by grace through faith. You don't release faith in your life, you won't walk in grace. If you don't believe the gospel, your life feels dry. You feel very empty. If you don't believe that your life is worth the blood, there's not a grace pouring over. Are you with me? Grace and faith go hand in hand. You're saved by grace through faith. No faith, no grace. It's impossible to please God without faith. Why? Because without faith, he can't release the grace to make you what he paid for. So he can't be fulfilled as a father watching you grow into fruition. Are you good? You guys are just kind of looking. This thing's for everybody. It's amazing. Guilt, condemnation, shame. I've got to go back to it. For some reason, it's, it needs hit hard here tonight. Guilt, condemnation, and shame. There's people that talk themselves into one of the three or all of the three. And, and they say, yeah, but brother, I should have known better. Okay, I get that. So at what point do you say, wow, should have known better, run to God be bold about that and humble about that and receive his love and mercy, become wiser and sharper, and now you know better. Why do you have to lose something in knowing better? Should have known better. So now I have to lose something? I have to lose three days of relationship? I have to lose a month of identity? You never step out of him. Come on, it's what Adam and Eve did in the garden. They took off and ran. They hid. They heard the sound of the Lord coming and ran from Father God because that's what sin consciousness does to people. They run and hide from truth. They start living quiet. They shut down. Ah, it's just sin has a terrible effect when you live sin conscious. You're, the, the, the cross takes it away. Like it's unscriptural for a Christian to be fighting with sin, trying not to sin, trying to do better. You're supposed to wake up and believe. Believe that he is. Believe he loves you. Believe he forgave you. Believe he lives inside of you. You start out your day in righteousness. Romans 6 says that place produces its fruit to holiness. All of a sudden, you're living holy without trying to be holy because you believe what he did is true. And it fixes your heart on him and empowers your ways. And all of a sudden, the tree's made good and the fruit follows. See, he's not telling you to do better and try harder and clean up your act. He says a good tree can't bear bad so we hear fruit and become tree assessors and go, oh my goodness, I can't be a good tree because there's a bad branch and fruit right here. Or there's a thing you've been ignoring or denying. And you hear the words say, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And you hear fruit and go, oh my goodness, I can't be a good tree. And then he says a bad tree can't bear and now you're confused because you go, wait a minute, there is some valid changes in my life and not everything's a throwaway. I'm troubled. A good tree can't bear bad fruit, but I see something on my limb that needs clipped. And a bad tree can't bear good fruit, but there's some things in my life that are good and should remain. All of a sudden you realize he's not talking about fruit. He's talking about your identity, the tree, knowing who you are. He's not talking about your actions. He's talking about your identity. He's saying when you realize you've been made a good tree, you can't bear bad fruit. But if you keep thinking you're a bad tree, you can't bear good fruit. Because all your efforts to bearing good fruit become striving to prove something that's already settled through his blood. Are you guys good? Because this is a good gospel. It's what's wrong with me. For 23 years, I've been this way. 
I just met somebody at a church I was at that hasn't seen me for years. They knew me four years in. And there he laughed and they said, I think you're worse than ever. I said, I keep telling people I'll always be this way or worse. Why? Because I'm going to keep getting to know him more. See, he hasn't changed since I've been saved. He hasn't changed since the foundation of the world. He hasn't changed since the beginning. So why would I change unless I get my eyes off of truth when truth makes me free and he that's free is free. So if I keep my eyes on truth and let the truth keep my eyes single, I'm always full of light no matter what. Because I'm not a conditional Christian. I'm not a Christian for things to go well. I'm a Christian to be like him. So I'm always receiving grace to fulfill that desire and faith. So come hell or high water, I'm positioned for Christ in me, the hope of glory. Whether you do me right or whether you do me wrong. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. That's on God's end. Well, he made us in his image. Why shouldn't that be our truth? Where sin abounds, we get hurt, broken, trusted, skeptical, pull back and get tentative. I don't think that's what scripture's talking about. Yay. Do you hear the freedom in what I'm saying? But you got to want this, people. We got to want this. We don't just want his blessings and the infilling of his spirit and all the terms we use. No, no, no. We want his heart and his nature and his ways because that's freedom. Like living for yourself is the biggest bummer on the earth. Like self-conscious, always worrying about how it's going to work out for you. It's like you're on this little saga journey with God and the whole, your whole life is everything's all about you. And hey, that's a strategy from the devil and he just, and I got to pray and they pulled out in front of me. That's the devil trying to ruin my day and all this weird stuff. Amen. I got a mic. I can even do better. Amen. Come on, and all of a sudden you're on this self-focused, self-centered jury calling it faith and thinking it's spiritual. Because <laughs> it's so self-conscious. It's so self-focused. You think the devil is so that caught up with you? No, he's already got you deceived. He probably don't even have to look your way. You're already doing good enough yourself. He's got you hook, line, and sinker. He don't even have to hold the rod. Probably just sticks it in the holder and goes get somebody a little more challenging. Because you're hooked. I'm just saying. My goodness, don't make it so easy for him. Let me try to get this done. Guilt, condemnation, and shame third, fourth time I'm trying to go back there. And then I get excited and preach a couple other things. Let me tell you what guilt, condemnation, and shame is. Guilt is a subconscious confession that you're not forgiven. They're all three anti-Christ, finished anti-Christ works. Guilt, condemnation, and shame are all anti-Christ things. Forget the book of Revelations when I say anti-Christ. What I'm saying is it's anti-finished work expressions. They're never in the tool belt of God. Guilt, condemnation, shame are never subcontracted by the Lord on your behalf. Guilt is a subconscious confession that you're not forgiven. Condemnation is a subconscious confession. It's you receiving the fact that you believe you're worthy to be judged instead of redeemed. Shame is a really, really Nasty one because it brings a lot of bad things on people's lives. Because shame is you believing you still are what you're ashamed of or you wouldn't be ashamed. It's hard for me to preach that and not cry. Because I see that when Rob, so many people whose hearts have changed. If your heart wasn't okay, you would not cry. If your heart wasn't okay, you wouldn't care. So being ashamed of what you did cannot be the answer when you cry yourself to sleep but don't fall asleep. You're already sorry. You must be alive inside. 
You must have seen the error of your ways. Why not run to him? Why are you hiding behind some rock somewhere? Naked when God paid the price to clothe you. Do you understand that he rules his kingdom with a scepter called righteousness? That he knights you and marks you not guilty when you bow before him. And he lets you stand before him without any sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. That's what the word righteousness means. To stand before the Lord without any shame, without any guilt, without any condemnation. To stand before the Lord and be right in his sight. Watch. As if you've never sinned. I'm not sure why people have a hard time preaching that. If you study the Bible and look at the words, that's what it means. You're acquitted. You're not guilty. You're as if you never sinned. So how can we be before the Lord through the blood as if we never sinned and remain sin conscious and think it's humility to boast in our ability to commit it? Well, brother, we're not perfect. We're always going to sin. What are you trying to say? You're freaking me out, brother. That's a little heresy red flag right there. What are you saying? You never sin, brother? See, I'm not even talking about the act of sin. I'm talking about the identity of being free from sin. I can show you in the book of Romans three times. It says you're free from sin. Free from sin. Free from sin. It's in the book of Romans. It's Romans 6. It's not my notes. It's the book of Romans. You're free from sin. Yeah, but brother, we're always going to sin. Stop! You can't even hear the word of the Lord. That's religion. Shh. You're letting human experience trump the grace of God that brings change to your life. So who's yet to tell what's possible to become? What grace did he pay for? Have we received the full measure of grace that he paid for on our lives? Have we believed to the place where every measure of grace he paid for has come upon us and made us what he paid for? Why don't we go after that? Why don't we see what living in the Spirit is? Why don't we, why don't we go after what's possible? Why don't we wake up every day and just believe we're righteous in his sight and that we're sons and we don't have nothing to prove? His love is already proven to our hearts through a Christ across, through a son crucified. And why don't we just live by the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh and present ourselves as members under righteousness which produces its fruit to holiness? Why don't we just live that way and come out of darkness into the light? Why don't we just reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God in Christ Jesus? That's all Scripture. Does that sound like, yeah, but brother, we're always going to sin. I mean, what are you saying, man? You're freaking me out. Are you perfect? I'm not even talking perfection. I'm talking purity of heart. And the pure in heart shall. Yeah? You're not waking up trying not to sin. I promise you, that is deception. You're waking up enjoying being his. That's the truth. The blood speaks better things than marking you for what you did wrong. The blood marks you for what he did right. And if you don't start where he finished, you'll never run well. Because you'll get tricked into trying to accomplish something he already did. And in your own strength, you'll fail and believe you're a failure and never grow in the knowledge of truth. And you know what all these lies are for? To keep you from ever being with him. Because the whole goal is you to reproduce after your own kind. Your whole goal is to bear fruit and multiply after your own. So if the enemy can lie to you and keep you from seeing what you've become, you can never reproduce the fruit after him. There's nothing on the earth that's multiplied without intimacy, without two coming together. There's nothing reproduced on the earth without two coming together. So if the enemy can keep you from coming together with him intimately, he can keep your life from ever being multiplied and reproduced from him. And you can have a knowledge of him. You can have a confession of him. You can have a Christian screensaver, ringtone, bumper sticker, and music playing, and a t-shirt that says lifestyle. And maybe not know him or be with him. And let all the things you do in his name take the place of knowing him. And have a form of something instead of becoming that very thing.
Don't any of you let that happen to you. It's a lie. Every one of you have a right to be in his presence. Adam was so sin conscious. Adam was so sin conscious. He ran from the sound of the Lord coming. And God found him. Adam, where are you? He knew where Adam was. He doesn't have to ask questions. He's giving Adam a chance to respond. Where are you? Adam. Adam, where are you? Could you imagine? Adam's like... I'm over here, Lord. I heard you coming. I was naked and ashamed, so I hid. Adam, how did you know you were naked? Did you eat the tree that I forbid you to eat? It was the woman that you gave me. She gave me to eat. Whatever that was. That was just a bam. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I know it's good. I... <laughs> no, it's the first sign of sin. It's the first effect of sin in your Bible. Right on the heels of sin, the first sign of sin is self-preservation, self-defense, self-awareness, self-centeredness, ashamed, it was the woman you gave me. What's he saying? He, did Adam eat the tree? Was the question yes or no? Could he say yes or no? No. He couldn't take responsibility because all of a sudden he's a defender of himself instead of truth. Because sin perverted everything that he was created to be. And everything he was created to be took a 180, bam, when he ate that tree. And all of a sudden what he's saying is, look. If you, when they gave me the woman, probably wouldn't eat the tree, dude. Like, work it out. <laughs> the Lord says, woman, what is this you've done? She said, it was the devil. He made me do it. That's really what she said. It was the serpent, for he gave me to eat. A lot of people teach, you know, Adam was standing right there when it all happened and he didn't take authority and step in and all that. I'm not sure I buy that. I, I look at Genesis 4 and, and the end of 3, and Genesis 3, I mean the end, and he says to Adam, because you heeded the voice of your wife instead of me. Here's what I personally believe happened. Everything's out to reproduce itself after its own kind because it's a law. Each seed after its own kind. So the devil sees man and woman made in God's image to rule the earth and have dominion. He's really ticked off because one day he said, I'll be God. I'll be in the highest place. I'll rise above God's throne and I'll sit in the highest place. Are you aware of that decree? And God says, you shouldn't have said that. Boom, boom, onto the earth. And it's dark and it's void and there's no form. And all of a sudden God, shoom, shoom, shoom. And now he breathes into dirt and a human being stands up that looks just like his father. And then he reaches into that fullness and that amazing revelation and brings out a woman. That's where you came from, ladies, the fullness of God in the man. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Whew. So God didn't make you because the man needed you in a sexual way, in a lustful way. He didn't even make a woman till he saw the fullness of God in the man. So the man is fully equipped to love her like he does. Amen. That's where woman came from in the Bible. So I always say if there's a man in a woman's life, it ought to be because of the fullness of God in the man, not because she's hot. Yeah, don't cheer me on too much, buddy. This topic is intense. <laughs> is there an area in our lives more exploited and more perverted? Is there an area more focused on than sexuality? There's nothing even a close second, people. Why? You don't counterfeit $1 bills. You go after something that has great value. 
And this whole sexual arena is so driven by emotions and sensuality. And it keeps men bound to feelings and flesh and fantasies. It tries to keep spirit-filled people living there. Come out from among them and be ye separate. There's a whole better thing on this side of the 180. Because when you look at the beginning... He says, let us make man in our image. So in the likeness of God, he made man, both male and female. In his own likeness, he made them, both male and. So what's a woman's created value? To serve the man or to be found in God's likeness? You're not here to serve the man. You're here to be like him. And if we all live to be like him, we'll serve one another. The reason she makes man complete it's because man has an avenue to love and reproduce now and express and multiply who God made him to be. He doesn't, she doesn't make man complete because he had a deficit without her. He makes man complete because he can manifest and reproduce with her and multiply what he was created to be. Till the whole earth is filled with his glory. And we've turned it into sexual relations, orgasms, loneliness, need to be loved, need to be held, need to feel special, need to be valued. We've turned it into curves and bus size and to just keep sensuality just thriving, keep the flesh raging, maybe even in the midst of our worship. Oh, it's, uh, I'm feeling that. <laughs> The first thing on every list of the flesh is sexuality. I could turn you to Thessalonians. I could turn you to Corinthians, Galatians. Yeah? Ephesians. Colossians. Sexuality, first thing on the list. And he doesn't tell you to manage it. He doesn't tell you to balance it. And he doesn't tell you to control it. He tells you to put it to death. Why? Because what you were trained in is a lie from hell. It was not from the beginning. Well, God gave us our sex drive. Stop it. Adam gave you what you grew up with. God gave you love, not sex drive. God gave you love, not sex drive. And just like we see his first love, we love him. The wife sees a love that she's sheltered in, protected in, that she's nurtured in, and she opens herself up to what is the safest place she's ever been and been held in that place. She opens up and responds in that love. The two come together and reproduce in that place after their own kind, and the earth is filled with his glory. It's not about orgasms. It's about holiness in his presence. It's about love. Why would you sell out for an orgasm when his presence wants to overtake you in your covenant union with your spouse? <laughs> I'm done with all that. Listen. Let me go back and get safe. I'll go, I'll go, go, go on safe ground. <laughs> Remember guilt, condemnation, shame? So let's go back to the end of Genesis. Now we're in Genesis 4. And, or, or the end of Genesis 3, I mean, and he says, it says that God took off the fig leaves from Adam and Eve. And what did he do? Put on animal skins that were made from his own hands. So, yeah, God's a hunter. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they had to skin them out. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> so because of their sin, something already had to lose its blood. Something lost its life because sin costs life. That's why sin, there's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood because sin costs life. But this isn't the redemption of man, this is just a sign to us. This is God prophesying and speaking. It's, 
You, it's righteousness. I know everybody preaches blood covenant there because the animals had to shed their blood to get their skins. And it's true. It's blood covenant. But why isn't it righteousness to us? He took off their fig leaves and put animal skins made with his own hands. So who clothed them? If he let the fig leaves on Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, every day they wake up, what is their awareness? The day they messed up and blew it big. I mean, you know, we, we have jokes and we blame it on the woman and the women get mad and say, well, he was in authority. He shouldn't have followed her. And there's fights all the time. And I heard this one story, you know, that this guy said he had a revelation that Adam and Eve and, and the kids, Cain and Abel, were walking through the mountains one day and it's desolate and charred and there's not much there. And they look down into this valley of lush and green and life and, 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 and Cain says, or Abel says, mom, dad. Look at that place down there. We should go live there. And Adam said, well, we used to, son, but your mother ate us out of house and home. <laughs> but, it's, but it's really not that way. Eve was deceived, and Adam followed her instead of God. So he literally committed treason and went against the word of the Lord and followed his wife. So it's really on Adam. I believe. So I just told that joke just because. I know, honey. I'm sorry. It was a bad joke. Oh. Was it that bad? She's my little friend. She sits right behind me. I tickle her. Now I tell a joke. She's crying. <laughs> if God leaves their fig leaves on, what's their conscious awareness every day they live? The day they missed and that they're separate from God and they're naked and they're ashamed. Every time the fig leaves start to wear out and they have to make new ones and cover themselves, what are they aware of? The day they blew it and messed up the best thing ever. So what's wrapped around that? Regret, guilt, condemnation. And the Bible says where there's regret, it's death. It leads to death. The worldly way, the worldly way, Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 7, the worldly way of sorrow is regret, and it leads to death. Because there's no redemption in regret. But the godly way is godly sorrow. Where you realize how you hurt the plan of God. You affected the lives of others. You lived outside of what was purposeful and right. And you go, whoa, duh, what was I thinking? You Whether you weep or whether you just sincerely go, man, and take a step back and look and go, whoa, and run to him. That's godly sorrow. It leads to repentance. There's a vindication in it, a clearing of yourself. There's an increased zeal and indignation towards the lie. And you prove to be clear in the matter by the way you live and respond. That's what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 7. It's very powerful. So guess what God does? God puts animal skins on them. So when they wake up and see the animal skins, what's their first awareness? The day God loved them, forgave them, and promised that there was a seed coming through the woman that would crush the head of the enemy. So what did God do by putting on the animal skins? He's prophesying the coming of his son in the day that men would live in righteousness covered by the work of God. So he rules his kingdom with the scepter of righteousness. And we've got to be skilled in righteousness. We've got to understand righteousness. And we've got to wake up every day and present ourselves as members unto righteousness. The Bible says you're a slave to righteousness. The word slave means chained and bound to to serve its testimony. <laughs> I'm I'm bound and chained to righteousness to live not guilty for the rest of my life because of his blood. Amen. Is that amazing or what? So why do countless well-meaning Christians that are sincere sell out to guilt, condemnation, and shame, identity crisis, insecurity, and unworthiness, and look in the mirror and not like who they are? Because we don't believe this gospel and we don't separate ourselves from the thing we did wrong and run to him. We're hiding in the fig leaves. And the just shall live by. 
Yeah, but brother, you don't know what I've done. He knew what you did before you did it, and he knew what you did before he sent his son. He sees all things. He's omniscient. He knows the beginning from the end. He, he knew you were going to miss it when he already was hanging there crucified. But he's hoping and desiring and believing that his life given would draw you unto him, that you would see his goodness, and you would be changed. Yeah? And then all this religion and all this other stuff creeps in. And works and legalism and all this stuff. And then this pendulum swings like this and people get real tight with it. And then the other camp goes, ah, and they get real loose with it. And then they get tighter and they get looser. And Jesus is standing here going, hey, guys, there's a happy place right here. And then instead of walking in love, these camps fight, and they write all this stuff. And next thing you know, you're not even preaching the gospel. You're just preaching what everybody's missing. You're not even preaching the gospel after a while. You're just preaching who not to listen to, who's wrong. <laughs> you preach the gospel. <laughs> If I preach a clear gospel, won't it protect you from the lies out there? Come on. So when God put the fig leaves on him, or off of him, and put the animal skins on him, what he's doing is, he's teaching them that every day they wake up, they think about the day that he came and forgave them in the midst of what they did wrong. How he loved them and made them a promise of a future. It's a sign of righteousness when he put those skins on them. A couple chapters later, men are continually wicked in their hearts. Continually. Do you know where I'm at? Genesis 6. And it says, the Lord looked and he was sorry that he made man. Because man was just poo. And people get, they tear those scriptures up. They're like, oh, so God was sorry? Then why did he make man in the first place? Well, he's not a man that he should repent. Why was he sorry? You get, we get so literal sometimes, we miss that God's looking, knowing the purpose and destiny of man. He knows why man's on the earth, and he's looking. It's so perverted, and, and, and everybody's doing the opposite, extreme opposite of what they're here for. Living for themselves at the cost and expense of one another when they're called to lay down their lives for each other. So guess what God does? He sends a flood. You know that, right? And Noah and his family built a big old ark. Got persecuted for it, but when the floodwaters came, they were in the ark. And they were floating on the water, and everybody drowned. Sounds pretty awful, huh? Peter explains it in 1 Peter 3. This is Genesis 6, man. This is only a few chapters past the beginning. Peter says, you know, there was a day when eight righteous souls were saved through water. Noah and his family, eight righteous souls, were saved through water. We have this anti-type which now saves us. I thought it was the blood, brother. It is the blood. But it's also water baptism. What do you mean? Listen. We have this anti-type which now saves us. Water baptism. Not the cleansing of your flesh, but the answer for a good conscience. Lord God. What's he talking about? What happens in water baptism? You die to everything you've ever been. When you come out of the water, what are you? Righteous in the sight of God. What happened in the days of Noah? God baptized the earth in water. And when he brought the earth out of the water, there was no unrighteousness on the earth. And the only thing that remained through the water was eight righteous souls. And then he spoke to Noah almost verbatim what he spoke to Adam from the beginning. Because the plan's the same. But he said this. He said, I'll never destroy the earth this way again. It'll never be like this. And he put a rainbow in the sky as a sign of his promise. What was he saying? There's a baptism coming that is unto righteousness, not death. And the only thing that will die is what men were. But they're coming out of it alive. Men will not lose their life in the baptism coming except the life that they were. Peter had a revelation and said there's an anti-type which now saves 
us. Who knows it would be good to have a good conscience towards God. Who knows a good conscience towards God would put you in intimacy with God and keep a veil off your face and you would stay one with him with a good conscience towards God. Is that true? So what's Jesus say in the book of Mark? Believe and be... He didn't separate the two. Believe and be... Believe and be baptized and you shall be... He didn't say, believe and you shall be saved. That's what we say. He said, believe and be baptized and you shall be saved. Why? He's going after the good conscience and the righteousness and the dead to everything we were. Why did water baptism almost slip out of the church in most circles? And sometimes it's an annual event at best. Because we don't preach transformation. We preach go to heaven. So we don't see the purpose of dying. We just say, confess him. You show me one place in the book of Acts where they preached the gospel without water baptism and where men got saved and they didn't baptize them immediately. It was all part of the message because it was all about transformation and coming out in righteousness. Believe and be, and you shall be sozoed. Healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole, and kept safe and sound. You guys with me? Come on, this stuff is not difficult. You know, Jesus says, believe and be baptized and you shall be saved. And you know what we've done? We've argued and split up and divided. Well, it's the name of Jesus only. It's the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. No, no, that's old covenant. That's new covenant. It's the name of Jesus. Immersion, sprinkling. Ah, And then all of a sudden we fight and we disagree. And it's just so simple. Believe and be baptized and you shall be saved. And we've made it complicated. He said, these signs shall follow those that believe. They'll cast out devils. They'll speak in new tongues. We don't even really sometimes believe there's devils. And we fight over tongues and think it's of the devil. Isn't it amazing what we've done with the precious gospel? Believe and be baptized. And you shall be saved. I've baptized people that were 20, so sincere, ready. I've had parents call me so offended and so mad at me and say, what are you doing baptizing my daughter? I had her sprinkled when she was born. And I'm like, well, good. Something took. That's awesome. You should be excited, mama. Nobody's violating your efforts. You're... We're not re-baptizing her. That wasn't a believer baptism. That was a christening. That was a dedication. That was you presenting your daughter to the Lord in faith, trusting his hand would be upon her life. She's 20. She wants him. She's laying down her life. Now it's her believer baptism. She didn't believe a thing. She doesn't even remember that when she was newborn. Why would you, in offense, deny her of her believer baptism? Maybe we do this stuff for ourselves to feel good. And then we get violated and offended when our feel-good is threatened. And now we're offended because, well, what's, what wasn't good enough about what I had done? <laughs> Probably time to die, mother. Here, we have a water baptism. I'll help you. <laughs> you can't believe how much this stuff happens when you're in ministry. The misunderstanding and how flared up people get and how hackled they get. Like, poof. Like the feather. I mean, it's amazing. It just shows that we don't understand we're supposed to be dead. Feathers just poof. I mean, we ought to all just get plucked. People say, well, they get on my nerves. I'm thinking you ought to get new nerves. You're praying for them to change so they don't get on your nerves. And I think God's saying, get new nerves. It's like my pastor, he was at an order, and this lady come up, and she tried, she flattered him a little bit. She was trying to honor him to get him to pray a little bit. She, she really, she said, it was funny. She's like, you are such a man of God. I know when you pray, God answers your prayers, and you walk close with him, and I really need you to agree with me and pray. And he's like, okay, honey, I'll just pray. You don't have to flatter me anymore. And she said, well, please just pray with me for my husband. He He knows how to get me going. He has learned what to do and how to push my buttons in the right way. And he does it on purpose. And it just gets me every time. And I want you to agree with God with me that God would cause him to stop pushing my buttons. (laughs) And my pastor's a very wise man. And he smiled and gently said, you know, I think I have a better line of prayer. 
She said, what? What do you want to pray, sir? Man of God. Let's pray that you go buttonless. <laughs> if there ain't nothing to push, what he's doing won't work. <laughs> if you got a button, it'll be pushed. And she went, oh, because that's not what people are looking for. That's that microwave thing Todd's talking about. They just want the spouse to change. But if the spouse changes, that just benefits you in that moment, but you're still the same person and somebody else could push a button. Probably be better to just get rid of the button. Yeah? Or try to pray the rest of your life that God orchestrates everybody the way you need them. <laughs> that would not be cool. Are you guys okay? Okay. I, uh, I don't even know what to do right now. I was opening my Bible in faith, hoping it landed somewhere. You want to go? Yeah, amen. Thanks. You want to go to John chapter 20 with me and we'll close. We're going to pray something tonight. We're going to have fun. Something, something good is going to happen in here. And it already has. But, but what I mean is God's going to manifest some things in our lives, our bodies. It'll be fun. He will. Yeah, I know he will. It's just the way he is. I preach this all the time. If you've listened to YouTube, you've heard me preach. I preach this all the time. It's in my top 100 list, this scripture. It's John 20. If you have a Bible, you can go there. If you want to pull it up on your phone because your screen will be lighted and you can read it, that would be good. I won't think you're texting. It doesn't matter if I think you are or not anyway. You know if you are, so... <laughs> did you ever hear somebody say well nobody will know you'll know and that's a problem because your conscience won't do well with that knowledge and then it'll subvert intimacy and you'll never bear fruit because you won't be with him bummer you know the story in John 20 Mary went to the tomb and the tomb the stone was rolled away and Jesus wasn't in there right it's one of the most phenomenal sections of scripture because it teaches us so much about this being free from sin thing and how God sees us. And who knows the setting? The setting is trauma. The setting is all these disciples are going to die for him at the supper table. He gets struck. They all scatter. One disciple runs out of his garments in his attempt to get away and streaks through the trees with nothing on. Now, I don't know about you, but if you run out of your clothes, you're probably trying to get away. <laughs> but a minute ago, they're going to die for him. Could you imagine Jesus if he was anything like us at the Last Supper? And he has foreknowledge that they're all going to scatter, and they're all sitting there saying, we'll die for you, we'll die for him. And they're all whispering among themselves, I don't know, I don't care what he says, you know. I mean, he's usually right, but, <laughs> but he... He thinks we're going to desert him. I'll never desert him. I'm ready to die for him. I ain't never denying him. I'll give him my life. Yeah, me too. We're in, dude. Yeah. It's probably where fist bumps started. Right there at that table. <laughs> Could you picture that conversation? They're all fist bumping under the table so Jesus can't see. But yet Jesus knows. Jesus knows they're going to betray him. Jesus knows Peter's denying him. Jesus knows Judas is already sold out. Jesus knows... Could you imagine if he was anything like us? He can't even break the bread. He can't even pass the cup. He's a hurting vessel, man. I can't even trust these guys. I poured myself into these guys intimately, and now they're going to bail on me as soon as I'm struck. They're going to pick up their own lives that they said they laid down, and they're going to run off and run away as if they don't even know me. That is painful. I'm hurt, and I need prayer. <laughs> Could you picture Jesus breaking the bread and looking around the table and going, I know you guys. I was going to break this and say something, but I just can't. You know, I thought I could trust you. I mean, I'm even wondering if it was the Lord's voice when I heard your names. Because if it was really God, I mean, you guys would be better. Then he sits down at the table and John comes over and snuggles. Get off of me, John. 
I'm tired of you acting like you love me when you're not ready to die for me. Just stay off of me. Look, it's a little tense right now. They're coming in a minute. And I'm going to die and you're going to run? And you're going to act like you love me? You don't love me. You love yourself. You say, well, he couldn't do that because all the scriptures were written. It was all one. He's Jesus. He couldn't do that because he's Jesus. He couldn't do that because he's love. That's why he couldn't do that. And he called you to love like he loves. And if he loved us this way, ought we not love one another? So when I put that mentality in his mouth, the reason we're laughing hysterically, because we know that's the common mentality on the earth, but it sounds hysterical putting it in the mouth of Jesus because we know the person of Jesus. So why doesn't that mentality sound just as hysterical in us? Because we're made for his image. And as the Father sent me, so I send you. And as he is, so are we. And the things I do, you'll do if you believe. And you're predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And he's firstborn among many. They're all scriptures. Like six of them right in a row. Boom, 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 boom. Do you need any more? There's a couple more. You have exceedingly great and precious promises by which... You partake of his divine nature, escaping the corruption that's in the world through self-centered seeking. Second Peter 1. Oh, it's right there. What's the promises for? To assure that you have ample grace to partake of who he is on the inside so you can be separate from living for yourself like you used to and escape the snare that's in the world. So if any man come after me, let him first deny himself. He didn't say first pray a prayer in case he dies tonight and hits a tree and doesn't make it. He didn't say that. He, didn't, he doesn't. If anybody is going to come after me, anybody, you're all invited. If anybody's going to come after me, let them deny themselves. Why? Because you were not made for you. You're made for my image. And I'm here representing the image you were made for. When you see me, you've seen the Father. Now don't just sing to me and don't just pray to me when you're in need. Follow me. So deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Taxi through life and situations with a perspective where you don't let sin against you have the right to commit sin in you or through you. You overcome evil with good. You tone down a harsh word with a kind word. You let mercy triumph over judgment. And you let mercy cover and love cover a multitude of sin. Follow me. Don't just come to me and try to get to heaven. Come to me and let me put heaven back into you so the kingdom of God is here. And don't look there and don't look there because it's in you. You see what's wrong with me? That's good news. And my problem is I believe it. I believe it. I'm going to sleep so good tonight, it doesn't even make sense to people. Like, I sleep about five hours. You'd have to hit me on the head with a hammer to get me to sleep more than five and a half. Why? How? It's full of life. I'm going to go to bed tonight. It's going to be like a battery charger. I'm going to lay down, and it's just going to be like, click. I'll go to bed. I'll have to go to bed by faith. I will. I'll lay in bed, and I'll be like, Father, you're just... And in about five hours, that little light will go. It's not. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm just telling you, full of life. Just, I'm like, I'm like a battery charger, man. Just boom, but I go to bed that way, wake up that way. That's what Todd was explaining this morning. You don't go to bed and make love with your pillow and be glad you made it through the day. Oh. 
That's why you can't get up in the morning because you can't face what you barely made it through. I mean, we call it depression. I call it wrong thinking. I'm not being mean to people that have clinical situations, but a lot of it's perspective problems. You can't face what almost destroyed you. How did Jesus wake up every day when they were constantly out to get him? He would stand in the streets and preach absolute, total, flawless truth. And all they would hear for and listen for is what they didn't agree with and what they could criticize. And he got up and faced that every day. He heard their thoughts which weren't cool and stayed the same. I love him. I'm learning from him. I'm going to follow him. How about following him with me? Yeah? I got to do this. It's going to get late. I'm sorry. They really give you the mic late here, though. You know, we like really are in love with Jesus and worship him. We do all them testimonies. Is it phenomenal or what? Listen to all the testimonies. I sit there and love the testimonies. But it's scary when you give me a mic at like 815. And I'm like just getting wound up right now. Like, I never, like, I never land. I just stop because of time. Like, actually, a week ago was the first time in my Christian life that I landed, that, that I was done preaching. I, 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 it, was, it was amazing to me. I was like, huh? The pastor looked at me like, for real? They said, well, we usually go to about 12. At 1127, I was done. And I stopped. But I landed. I was done. I knew I was done. And the Lord was like, if you talk anymore, you'll talk too much. You're done. I went, this is the first time ever. <laughs> like, I have never heard the control tower say, bring it in, Dan. <laughs> ever. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going. I see the runway. I see where we can land. We're right in line. We go right back around. You say, aren't you going to run out of fuel? <laughs> Not a chance, buddy. <laughs> we were all night long. People falling out of windows. <laughs> Come up. But I never heard the control tower tell me to bring it in. Ever. People teach how you got to learn to wrap up and cast the net and end a sermon. I don't even know what they're talking about. I stand up here and my heart goes... <laughs> Like, I don't even know what's coming out next. I have nothing planned. My preparation's being with him. You know what he told me a long, long, long time ago? Like 23 years ago? Three days saved. God spoke to me in English. He said, I'm going to put revelations of my love and righteousness in you, and you're going to speak to many of my people. He said, however, I don't ever want you to read your Bible to preach a sermon. He said, I only ever want you to read your Bible to know me and only ever speak out of who I am in your life. And that will carry weight and bring change. Yeah. Let's do John 20. So the guys are scared. They're in the room. They're scared. They're hiding somewhere. They're afraid. We would have too. We're not dishing on them. We're not making fun of them. They were afraid of death like some Christians in New Covenant are afraid of death. They were afraid that what happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. So they were huddled for fear of that and afraid to leave the room. Miss Mary, she just goes right out to the tomb because she loves him. He's the best thing that ever happened to her. And she don't care if he's dead. It's the best way she can relate. She'll just lean against the stone with her cheek on it if she has to. But she's going to be where he is. That's Mary. I love it. Mary gets there and the stone's rolled away and he's not there. That's a little startling to a woman like Mary. You got to understand this is not a Bible story. This isn't a movie scene. This is real. This happened to a woman that knew him. A woman that loved him. Obviously with her life. So she gets there and Jesus says to her in verse 15, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposing him to be the gardener said, Sir. Now I can't answer. I don't know. Haven't even thought about it or really asked the Lord about it. It didn't seem that important ever to me. But 
I'm thinking about it right now. I don't know why she didn't recognize him immediately. Because she thought he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him. Look how much she honors him. She just wants to get his body. Tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, imagine this, guys. This happened to Mary. She loved him. He said, Mary. And she goes, can you imagine? The last time she sees him, he's unrecognizable and dead. And you can't tell it's him unless you were with him from the beginning because he was marred more than any of the sons of men. Jesus' visage was marred more than anybody ever was by people. It's in your Bible. The worst thing they've ever done to a man, Jesus looked worse than that. When you light somebody on fire on a stake and stack wood around that stake and torch a person, when the fire goes out, do you think you can tell that they're even male or female? He lost his appearance. He, he, he lost his visage. You couldn't recognize him. You didn't even know who it was. Why was it so, so, why? Why did it, ha why couldn't it just be 39 lashes and some spikes and some blood? Because in the garden, God made man for his image. And he told Adam to never eat the tree or the day you eat the tree, you're surely going to die. He was talking about the image because Adam didn't fall over dead. So when sin got done with Adam in the garden, he didn't look anything like he was created to be. He lost his appearance. So Jesus had to come and lose his appearance as a man to pay the price to get man's appearance back in the Lord. He was separated from God, so you're forever joined. He died, so you'll forever live. He was marred beyond description, so you and I could get our identity back. It's very powerful. You got to see this stuff. It's more than an Easter story, a suffering Savior. It's God becoming man and fulfilling what man failed, so man could be restored back. To what he was created to be. Don't minimize it. Don't follow the flesh. Let's go after this thing. He says, Mary. And she turned to him and said, Rabboni. Which means teacher. She recognized him. It's you, teacher. Now, you know she's bolting for him. She's going right at him. She's not like backing up. Oh, she's running straight at him. Because he said, don't cling to me, Mary. She's coming hard. <laughs> she's like, Rabboni. She's coming. And he says, don't cling to me, Mary. Why? Is he unsocial? He tells you why. Don't cling to me, Mary. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. What's he saying? The reason I'm here, the reason I came, has come. It was finished on the cross. I didn't need to take any more beating. It was all complete. I gave my spirit up. I died, but now I'm raised from the dead. The best part is coming right now. I'm going to take my blood, not the blood of bulls and goats, but I'm going to take my own blood into the mercy seat, into the heavenly tabernacle, and I'm going to be a priest unto God for man, and I'm going to sit down on that blood at the right hand and make mediation on behalf of men for all time. So Mary, don't cling to me yet, because I didn't wrap this thing up yet. I got to go to the Father. That's what's happening. You'll see. It's Hebrews 9. It's right here. It's unfolding. Hebrews 9 is happening right here. This is how you know it. Don't cling to me, Mary. I have not yet ascended to my father. But go tell my low-life, backstabbing, <laughs> two-faced, say one thing, do another, non-disciples, that I have plenty of issues and concerns about them, and I'm thinking of enrolling them into some more discipleship courses. Don't cling to me, Mary. I haven't yet ascended to my father. But would you go tell my brethren? 
Isn't that amazing? They didn't do one thing right. And when he called them brother and he's saying, I haven't changed my mind about you. I know what you're here for. I know what I've invested in you and I know what's possible. You go tell my brother and that I'm going to my father and your father. He's making us one. I'm going to my God and your God. <clears throat> what's he saying to them boys? I'm not mad and you're not disqualified. You know what the word father means there? Come forth from. I'm going to the one I came forth from and I'm going to the one you came forth from. You know what the word God means there? Source of life. I'm going to the source of life and he's your source of life. You came forth from the source of life. Mary came and told the disciples and that she had seen the Lord and spoken these things to her. And then the same day in the evening. Now we know he was on the road to Emmaus with two other disciples in another gospel. And right about evening time he broke bread and their eyes opened and they went, oh, That was the Lord. We should have known. Didn't our hearts burn when he spoke? Wow, that was the Lord. So I'm not sure. He had a busy schedule that day. But we know he said he was going to the Father. So did he go to the Father? He said, don't cling to me. I haven't yet ascended. So do you think he ascended? Because he came back same day. Here's how you know he ascended. It's Romans 5.1. You now have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. By faith through the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning his blood, and have access into this grace in which we now stand. So you have, what did the blood do? Made peace between God and man. What's the first thing out of his mouth when he walked into the room of the guys that were assembled for fear of the Jews? He walked in and said, peace to you. Why? Because right now his blood is on the mercy seat speaking better things. And men are no longer seen guilty in the sight of God for their sins when they believe. So watch what he does. He, he, he helps make them believers. Hands, his side, they were so glad when they saw it was the Lord. Do you see that in your Bible? So glad when they saw it was the Lord. As soon as they realized, it's really you. What's the first thing that you think hit their souls? How they betrayed him. How they denied him. How they didn't do one thing right. Do you think that's probably what happened? What's the next thing out of his mouth? He says, peace to you. Shows him his hands, his side. They go, wow, it's really you. And then they go, ugh. And the second thing out of his mouth, peace to you. It's a different peace. The first piece is, I've made peace between you and God. You have peace with God. The second piece is, hey, I know how you're feeling right now, but stop it. It's okay. I love you. Don't you be condemned. I haven't changed my mind about you. How do you know he's saying that, Dan? You're reading into that. Nope. Watch. Peace be to you. Watch. As the Father sent me, so I send you. He's totally commissioning them to follow him, and they've done nothing right to this point. His blood speaking better things, qualifying them and making them righteous in the sight of God. So he's handing them the baton of the new covenant, New Testament church. And we say, as he says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And we usually bring in the power of God there in miracles. But for God so... So how did God send the Son? In love. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Now watch what he did. This is the part that gives the whole chapter away. When he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So it sounds like Jesus is a little charismatic. Maybe he's been going to a spirit-filled church for a while. I don't know. But he's like, receive Holy Spirit. Whoa. Just having fun with you. He holds all things together by the word of his power. Why doesn't he just say receive Holy Spirit? Why did he breathe on him? Very important. You don't miss this. He's the redemption of man. He brings man back to the beginning. So what happened on the first day of man? God saw man for what he wanted to make man to be. 
and he breathed on that vision. And man became a living being. He goes, puts his blood on the mercy seat, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So now he took the sin away. He didn't just forgive it. He took it away, came back day one. Where God breathes into man and man can live again as if sin never happened. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is still there. The voice is still there. Follow me. And the just shall live by. Are you guys getting this? It's the only reason he would breathe. Why wouldn't he just say be filled with Holy Spirit? He breathes so we don't miss it. That we're brought back to the beginning to original value. And our consciousness is no longer sin but Christ in us. So we wake up every day and celebrate that truth. Trees that become good and our fruits automatic. Trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Are you with me? So that's your life in Him. Not being mean, not being sarcastic. I can't live that for you and no one can live that for you. You got to say in your heart, that's amazing and I believe that God and that's my purpose. That's my potential. And that's how you see me. Because you died once for. And I'm not going to be so self-centered and deceived that I exclude myself from all. Yeah? I've had people say, yeah, brother. I mean, hey, it works for you. It just doesn't work for me. Oh, my goodness. Stop. Stop, 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 stop. That's deception. It's not that the gospel works. It's relational and it's God loves you. So you be loved by God and your life be changed. Do you know why we pray for the sick? You know why Todd prayed for the sick last night? You say, because they were sick. Well, that sounds right. But the reason we pray for the sick and should have faith to pray for the sick is the forgiveness of sins. And by his stripes we're healed. He bore our sin and your sin and my sin in his body on a tree that we having lived for righteousness, not guilty. We're not guilty. By his stripes we're healed. Do you remember the serpents that came in the wilderness and they were biting people and they were dying by the thousands? Because they loathed the worthless bread. The manna that was coming down from heaven, they said, and what is this worthless stuff anyway? Well, it was a type and shadow of the bread that was coming. It was a sign of the gospel and God's provision and sustaining power through Christ. He said, I was the, I'm the bread. So the bread was Christ. And guess what they did? They complained and loathed it and said, we don't want this stuff anymore. What is it anyway? Manna. And thousands of them died when these serpents came. And Moses went on behalf of the people because they said, look, Moses, we've sinned. We've made a big mistake. Would you go tell God we're sorry? So Moses runs over to God and tears another robe and throws some dirt on his head and says, God, would you forgive the people? He says, you know what? I'll forgive them. He said, here's what I need you to do, Moses. You take bronze, melt it down, and make a replica of that serpent that's biting them. And you hold it up on a pole. And it'll be that every man that looks, it's still the medical symbol to this day, the serpent on the pole. It'll be that any man that was bitten looks at that pole and sees that serpent on the pole, and, and, and if he was bitten, he'll be healed. Well, I was five, six, seven months saved, and I'm sitting on my bed reading that, and I'm like, this is really weird. You're not supposed to make graven images. You're not to make false idols. Why would you make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole? Why wouldn't you wave a flag that says Yah? Why wouldn't you take Aaron's rod that budded and, and hold it up to represent life? Why wouldn't you take the Ark of the Covenant and elevate it so people could see? Why would you put the serpent that was killing them, make a replica, and put it on a pole? And the Lord said, it's very simple, Dan. They're my Hebrew people. They understand the law that anything hanging on a pole has been cursed by God. So I put the thing that was killing them on a pole... Faith rose in their heart because they knew I answered Moses' prayer and cursed what was killing them, and they were instantly healed. And he who knew no sin was made to... So did God curse his son on the cross, or did he curse sin in the flesh? You're not supposed to see a suffering Savior. 
You're supposed to see sin cursed by God. And it'll be that any man looks to him by his stripes we are. Because I'm not guilty. I'm not condemned. He was made to be sin so I could become the righteousness of God in Christ and be judged not guilty. We turn him into a, suf we turn him into a suffering Savior and a passport to eternal life. And we miss that the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. That sin shall have no dominion over me because God cursed sin in the flesh. We're supposed to get that. So it's why we pray for the sick. Yeah, can we, is there a way to get some lights out here so we can see each other or can't you do that? Or would that mess up something? Somebody help me. Can we? Don't they turn them lights on? Or do they keep you guys in the dark? Or why doesn't somebody like turn on the light? Like, like I want to be able to see you guys. We need to see each other. There, there we go. Good. We're going to do something. We're going to close, but I want to do something, okay? I usually have an order call for this. I'm not. I'm going to let you guys pray for each other, and it's going to be phenomenal. Yeah, that's exactly what I feel like. It's called redemption. It's brought back to original value. I get testimonies from people because I preach this stuff, okay? The reason I get testimonies isn't like just because I'm anointed, I have a gifting. I'm not making light of that stuff, but we focus on it so much. Oh, you're so anointed. You have a gifting. Or please, you got to pray for me. Stop, stop. You believe the gospel. That Stop running to one person all the time for prayer thinking they got a grip on something. The whole reason we're to teach is to teach and train and train and equip and multiply for the work of the ministry. Yeah? So, so the reason that I get these emails and testimonies isn't because of the gifting on my life. It's because of the message I preach. Don't miss that. I can tell when I say that, there's always people that want to fight that and they don't believe that. They think the reason that there was healing last night is because we're under the umbrella of Todd White's ministry. That's what people believe. Nope, it's because we're making the gospel simple and saying he loves us all this way and we can all be believers. You show me one scripture that it says these signs shall follow the gifted. The sign follows who? Believer. And I think that's you and me. I saw the sick killed way before anybody called me pastor. Why? Because I'm a believer. But here's the testimonies I get from people. Because I preach this. And we're going to do it tonight. I'm not going to have an order call. I usually have an order call. And I, I have fun with it because I don't usually pray for people much in services because then the focus gets on the individual that's ministering and the speaker. But when it comes to redemption, I usually jump in and have fun because I like it. And uh, I like when Jesus takes something out of your body that's not supposed to ever come out. I really like it. Like an STD, like hepatitis, like the email I just got. After several tests, HIV undetectable. Not because I'm anointed and gifted, because I preach this stuff. Because I stood on the beach on Florida, and she said, are you trying to tell me that God would take AIDS out of my body? I said, I'm telling you, he absolutely would take AIDS out of your body. If he forgave you of all your sin and will never see you as a drug addict or a prostitute, then why would, if God will never judge you, honey, for where you've been, why is where you've been judging you? If old things pass away and all things become new, that ain't new. That's old. That needs to go. So if you could go back and do over again and change those days of a drug addiction, would you? Of course, you're not using anymore. You're not selling your body anymore. You're not doing cheap tricks to stay high, sweetheart. You're not the woman you're telling me about. You've been changed. So if God will never judge you for where you've been, where you've been should never have the right to judge you. Because all things are made new. Well, yeah, but brother, she made her bed. She needs to sleep in it. No, no, no. Jesus has a brand new bed prepared for her. It's called New Life Through Jesus Christ. Clean sheets, amazing. Amen. Crawl in and sleep tight, baby. <laughs> yeah? Come on.
If you're a new creation and old things pass away and behold, all things are new, then why should that thing be there? Here's what qualifies you for redemption. If you could go back and do something over now that you know what you know, you would. But here's the dilemma. You can't. But you can change. And when you change, you'll never be judged for what you were. You'll be judged for what you've become. And God will never see you for your past. He'll see you for your present and things to come. Do you know how many good-hearted people made bad mistakes, made one vital sexual mistake, and that thing bit them and marked them for life and put something in their blood like an STD that's incurable? And now they get married and have to jump that hurdle for the rest of their life because they made a mistake when they were 17 and were sure they were in love and thought they were going to get married anyway. And, or they were just insecure and felt lonely and just needed to be with someone. And then they got born again. Or they got repentant and said, man, that is not the answer. Jesus, you're all I want. I want to save myself for covenant. Why should the STD from when you were 17 track with you for the rest of your life and keep reminding you of the day you were? I think we ought to get aggressive and say that stuff needs to come out. If you were going through a dark season and you were cutting yourself, because you just were numb and you lost sight of your value and you were in this dark season and you were just cutting yourself. Why should those scars have to stay in your life the rest of your life? If you see now and you see your value now, oh, I, I'm sure you could turn it into a testimony. But what would touch your life greater? Turning that into a testimony or looking down and seeing they're not there? I've seen a whole lot of this stuff in my life because I preach it, not because I'm gifted, because I preach it. I've seen young ladies stand in an order that were covered with burns and scars and would wear long sleeves because they didn't want people to keep asking what happened to them. And then they roll up their sleeves and scream and shake and cry. Because Jesus puts new skin on their body. Yeah. So I'm either a sicko and I'm making that up for some temporal applause. Or I'm telling you the truth. It's one or the other. So maybe tonight we ought to go for some redemption, huh? Maybe tonight we ought to be like really seriously humble in front of one another. And acknowledge if we have a situation like that and ask the people around us to believe that God redeems it completely. Because here's the deal. We're all in the same boat. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Some of us sinned and deserve a mark and never got one. Some of us messed up one time in an arena and got bit for life. Some of us sinned way more in an area than others and got away with it, it seems like, in the long run. Now we're forgiven and yay, and we're on, and we're smarter, but we never came out with more. And other people got hammered and marked in that place. It's not fair. There's no mercy out there. I was in a service like this one day, way back when I first started preaching this. I tell the story all the time because it's one that moves me so much. It's very emotional. It was a low 50s aged lady she's in the middle and we're praying and I told everybody it's none of my business what's in you what you got I don't need to know I just need to know you're free so we're praying boom 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 I even told him that night I said I don't need no catchers I don't need nothing it ain't they ain't falling that thing's coming out just just leave me alone with Jesus we'll be fine boom, 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 boom. I get to this lady and she grabs my arm and cries and looks at me in the eyes and she says I'm not that kind of girl. I'm not that kind of girl. I'm not that kind of girl. And it just ripped my heart. I'm looking at this sweet lady crying, saying this. You know what she's saying. And I said, honey, stop. I don't need to know. I'm just going to praise you. No, no, no. no. She leads up and tells the whole story in my ear. She's married for 30 years to the same man. Turns out that it was the only man in her whole life she ever knew sexually her husband. That's a rare testimony. Never committed a sexual sin in her life. 
But guess what? 30 years into the marriage, he gets his eyes on a 35-year-old. For some reason, she's attracted to the 52-year-old. And they take off together. Him and his new model. And guess what she does? Breaks and fall apart and feels like she's not a woman anymore. I lost my attractiveness. I don't have it. I'm old. Abandoned, alone, 30 years, he's going. This guy, short way, rolls into her life and starts encouraging her and telling her things she so needs to hear. And in no time, she crawls in bed with him. While she's in bed, it hits her. <gasps> she said, I pushed him off. And said, no, no, this is wrong. She's crying, telling me the whole story. I'm like, ah! She said, I grabbed my things and I ran. <sighs> Can you imagine the torment of that night for her? Can you imagine the torment in the morning? Can you imagine what's going through her for the next weeks? Now we got a problem. Symptoms start breaking out in her body. She's like, what is this? What is this? This is weird. She goes to her family doctor, lifelong family doctor. He does these tests. He sits her down and says, honey, we need to talk. What's going on with you? Like, what's happening in your life? <sighs> she tells him the whole story. He said, you have an incurable STD. That's in your nervous system. It will deplete some major organs and it will cost you years on your life. One sexual sin in her whole life in a moment of deception and vulnerability. And that thing bitter for keeps. Because there's no mercy in that arena. But guess where there is mercy? <laughs> Religion says, well, brother, she should know better. She needs to get a grip on her emotions. You don't go compromising the truth because your husband left you. You should have never crawled in bed with that man. You reap what you sow, brother. <sighs> you don't even know God. Trying to talk about him. Tragedy. I looked at her with so much passion. And I said, I said, stop. You've told me plenty. Stop. She's looking down at the carpet now because she's confessed and she feels ashamed because she's relating to what she did. And I said, no, no, you need to look at me. And she's looking down. I tipped her chin and made her look me right in the eyes and she's struggling to hold that look. I said, no, no, look at me. She looks me right in the eyes. I said, that's coming out of you. Do you hear me? And I said, and there ain't nothing nobody can do about it. Well, that's arrogant, brother. That's relationship. You call it whatever you want, but you just don't understand. You're just quick to speak. Amen. I know you do. So I prayed and said something simple like, come out of her. And don't you ever touch her again. No fire, no lightning. She didn't shake. She didn't tremble. No ushers. Just went down then and just prayed for the rest of the people. Six weeks later, I went back to their church because I was helping out because they didn't have a pastor. She came running to me. She's lit up and bouncy. She, pastor, pastor, guess what? I said, what? <laughs> she said, they've done several tests in a row. And there's no trace of it in my blood. So I'm a teacher, right? You figured that out, I'm a teacher. So I didn't celebrate, I didn't clap. It wasn't because I'm not honoring God. He knows, he leads me to do stuff all the time. And most of the time, I don't even know until it's over. And I go, that was cool. But I looked at her real calm and I said, it wasn't arrogance. I said, of course it's gone. I said, do you know why? She said, yes, because he's so loving and he's so merciful. God is so kind. And I laughed and said, yes, he's all those things.
But all those things he is needs a place to land in your life. So let me tell you why that's not in your blood. She looked at me puzzled like, I already told you why. I tipped her chin and I said, because you're not that kind of girl. Bam! Oh. <laughs> Woo! Is that a good gospel or what? Was she that kind of girl? Absolutely not. You think just because you did something, that's who you are. She is tore up over it. She needs a better plan called redemption and restoration and vindication and total healing. <laughs> so what do you say we believe for that kind of move in the room tonight? What do you say that we believe that whether you've hurt your memory through a binge, long-term abuse, you don't concentrate, you don't sleep well, you just don't have the function like you used to emotionally, that God would make that completely new tonight? What do you say that if you've got something in your blood that's not from the beginning, that's a product of where you've been and what you've done, whether it be a hepatitis, an HIV, an STD, something in your blood that we believe God would just completely cleanse your blood tonight through his blood. Would you want to do that? What about if you've cut yourself and marked yourself and scarred yourself that you would be honest and humble and say, I went through a dark season and I've done some things to my body. I want to believe God would take that away. You want to believe that he'll do that? What do you say? Do you think he might? Yeah. <laughs> I know he will. <laughs> so what do you say we do that tonight? I've never done it this way, so this is, a, this is new for me. So I'm going to step out in faith and do what I felt like I perceived when I was sitting over there. I usually have an altar call and I pray over everybody because I like to, because I know I have faith for redemption because I've seen redemption countless times. I saw a lady... A young lady who took a razor blade 10 times down the fronts of her thighs and spaced it. It looked like she used a ruler. She had 10 down this one and 10 down this one right in the fronts. Three inches long, raised up purple because of cut over top of cut over top of cut. Now she's born again. And she looks at her legs and wishes she didn't mark her one time God-given legs. And she's weeping about what she did, but she did it. But she's changed. And as we prayed for her, all 20 of those raised, elevated, three-inch scars completely vanished as we prayed. Well, I don't believe that, Dan. I understand unbelief's a real problem in the body of Christ. It really is. <laughs> but it happened. In that same altar call, there was a boy standing who had a purple railroad track carved into his forearm. Purple, it looked like a tattoo, but it was a scar. God healed his mind, and as he was being prophesied over, the railroad track disappeared in front of our eyes as mom hyperventilated, screamed, and almost passed out. Mm -hmm. What well, do you say we believe God for redemption? Yeah. If you marked your body, we're, we're going to do this together. So stay with me and, and let's stay in order. It's a lot of us, but I'm on a mic so we can do this. I've never done it this way, so be patient with me. I'm walking this out in faith too. Not the redemption part, the way it looks part. <laughs> if you need redemption in your life and you've marked your life in some way, through wrong living, mistakes, being somewhere you shouldn't or doing something you wish you didn't. But in your heart, you're saying, man, if I knew na then what I know now, I wouldn't have been there then. I've changed. But nonetheless, I'm still carrying the remembrance of that in my body, whether it's my flesh, my blood. Are you following me? 
I need you to stand, and only you, stand to your feet if you have something you're carrying from your past in your present. Stand to your feet and be humble. It's not about what you've done and where you've been. Everybody in this room has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I've done things in my past that deserved a mark. I just never got one. My son, he says, Dad, I should have got a mark over again and over again a hundred times and never somehow got a mark. I know some people that hardly did much at all and got a mark. So whether you did much or did a little, if you have a mark from yesterday and you're saying, I wish I didn't do what I did. I just wish I didn't go where I went, but I can't change that and regret would eat me alive. So I'm going to stand before God and believe he loves me, redeems me, and forgives me. And I'm going to believe that total redemption comes to my spirit, soul, and body blameless till he comes. Are you willing to do that tonight? Come on, I need some more people to stand. I know it in my heart. Stand to your feet real quick. Don't be ashamed. Stand to your feet. I need some people. You're holding out. You didn't stand yet. Come on. It's a bunch of you. I saw it in my heart. Good. Thank you. You're standing. I've probably 25 people stood since I said that, just so you know, because I can see everybody. Anybody else need to stand? Come on. I wouldn't wait if I didn't believe this was real and I didn't believe you were still sitting and don't want you involved. I got plenty of people to pray for. We got enough standing, but I want everybody. Stand to your feet if that's you. Don't sit down. And don't think, I wonder what people will say. I wonder what the guy beside me, what my family member will say. Come on. Why are you living in a closet in the dark anyway? Let's just get this thing out here. Let's just get in the light and let's go through it and let Jesus redeem it. Right? I'm going to have you stay standing here and then I'm going to have you raise your hand here in a second. And the people that are around you, I want to make sure that Everyone has at least one person with them. Don't gang pile up on somebody until everybody's covered, okay? Like, don't 10 of you surround somebody just because they're close. Make sure everybody gets covered before we tag team. You get it? If you want to, when they get to you, if you want to tell them what it is that you stood for and you don't mind telling them, because you feel like it's a contact point of faith and they can pray specifically if that's where your faith is, that's totally acceptable. But listen, people that are praying, if they just say, just pray for me and they don't want to talk about it, that's okay. It really is okay. It's none of our business what's going on there. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Stand up. She just asks of emotions. If her emotions are sometimes are connected to wrong believing, so you don't always need prayer. You need truth in your life, but I feel like it would be good for you to stand. Okay? Somebody's going to stand with you. It's going to be a really good night for you. Yeah. Because look at me, honey. Jesus loves you. He will never, ever see you for anything that you've done, and he doesn't see you for anything done to you. And you've got to be very careful. You don't see yourself for what was done to you. And what you've done, but you see what was done for you through him. And that's what separates you. Tonight, you're going to receive a grace to live sanctified. Amen. You really are. I see it in my heart. Yeah. I feel like the peace of that's already coming on you right now. It's really good. If you have scars, if you've cut yourself and you want to tell the person, listen, I just want you to pray. If they're in a disclosed place and you can't see them, that's fine. You don't have to show them to anybody. If you want to tell them, just tell them. If it's hepatitis, tell them if you want to. If it's STD, tell them if you want to. Uh, sometimes that's healthy for you to just say, you know what? I made a lot of mistakes in my life and... Yeah, I'm carrying an STD, man, and I don't want to take that the rest of my life and into my marriage. And God, I know God loves me and forgives me. So do you all follow what we're doing? So before we pray, I need you all that are standing just to look at me real quick here. Just look at me and, and answer this one question in your heart. Knowing the person you are now and the revelation you've walked in and you've grown in and the way you've come to know God at whatever level that is. If you could go back and do things over concerning yesterday. Would it look different now that you know what you know now? Would it? Absolutely. That's a passionate absolutely with tears. I like it. So here's what I need you to do too. So do you believe God loves you? Do you believe he forgives you of everything you've ever done? Then I believe we ought to be redeemed, huh? So raise your hand real high. Just one hand. We're not praying. I'm not praying for you. I just want people to know who you are. There's a lot of you standing. People sitting, 
Go run to them real quick. Don't pray yet. Don't pray yet. Just go grab them. Say, hey, you're mine. As soon as they grab you, put your hand down. As soon as you get claimed, put your hand down. Put your hand down if they get you. I only want your hand up if nobody found you yet. Man, there's a lot of guys in the upper room back there, man. Somebody make sure they go get them. Look at that. Them guys are in heavenly places, man. Go get them. Keep your hands up back there, guys. Somebody's coming. Keep your hand up until somebody gets you. If you're on the floor, don't tag team. I don't want three on one when we still have hands raised. I want one on one until everybody's covered. Don't only have your hand up if you don't have anybody. Okay, I got a guy right here. Can somebody find their way to him? You got him? Good, good. How about the girl behind you? Or is she... Yeah, we can get her hand down if she's claimed. There's a guy back there in a pink like shirt. I think it's pink. That's a secure man. That's awesome. Dude! You look good in pink, man. You got him? Is there anybody that's not accounted for that we don't have? Go like this, please. It's a very large room. We got everybody? In the next two seconds, three seconds, either tell them what you're believing for or just say, I don't need to share. Just believe for me. I'm believing for redemption. If you want to tell them, tell them. One's not right. One's not wrong. Just tell them. Sometimes it's good because it releases faith in each other. Okay, you ready? Does everybody know what they're praying or that, or, or that, that needs to know? No. And is everybody ready to pray? Are you ready? Now listen, careful, listen careful. When you pray, I just want you to speak redemption over them, that God makes all things new. If they told you what it was, let's just say it's an STD. STD, you come out of their blood. Herpes, you leave. HPV, you come out of them and you never touch them again. Father, thank you for loving them, forgiving them, and washing them clean, right? Simple, direct prayer. It shouldn't take, it should be under 10 seconds. If you were a cutter and you told people I was a cutter, you pray for everything to disappear right now. Okay? Okay? If you didn't tell them you were a cutter, believe it's going to go. All right? Are you ready? Pray for them right now. Redemption in Jesus' name. Completely clean in this room. Yeah. Yeah. Clean blood. Yeah, HIV, leave. Hepatitis, go. STDs, leave. Every scar, every mark from that season, go. Suicidal scars, go. Jesus' name. Minds be restored. Emotions be restored. Memory be restored. Amen? Start thanking God right now if you're being prayed for. Thank God that he loves you. Start thanking God that he forgives you. A lot of you are going to need to get a test done to see your blood and check your blood. But what I need you to do right now is just say, thank you. You love me. You're doing it in me. You love me, God. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank God. Begin to thank God that he loves you, okay? You don't need to pray anymore. Thank God. If it's not, if it's not too discreet in an area, if it's an area you can look and you were a cutter and you're not ashamed to start checking and looking, look and check. If you were a cutter, look and check if you can without giving it, without getting in proper. Check, your, check yourself. If you were a cutter, if you were a cutter and you're looking at some spots that had marks and they're not there, let us know who you are. Be humble and let us know who you are. Is there any? Yeah? Anybody out there, you were a cutter and you're looking. Check. Don't be ashamed if you, if you can. Not everybody can. Sometimes I've learned that they, you do it in other places. Scars are going. Anybody? Let me see you. I know there's people we prayed for. Going? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, they will. And they'll just go, go, go. Just thank God for that. Anybody else? Scars, cutter, right there? Going. Going. Yeah. 
Put your hands down so we can see. Who else? A cutter. It's just something we can check. Cutter, you know they're gone. Who are you? There's got to be more. Yeah, there, and there. Yeah, right there. Woohoo! Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? The only reason I'm asking that one specifically is because that's one that you can obviously check. You can't check for hepatitis right now, probably, or you can't check for HIV. But a cutter, you can check. Suicidal scars. I've seen, I don't know how many people, they had their whole wrist lacerated from a drunken binge carving themselves, and Jesus took that all away. Is there anybody else? You were a cutter, and you're checking, and your scars are going. Is there anybody that didn't acknowledge that, and you need to? It's good. It gets everybody excited and happy. Yeah? You? Yeah? It's going. Completely going. Yeah! Yeah! Now listen, if you're standing there and you're saying, man, I can still see my scars, here's what I need you to do right now with me, okay? Don't turn this into a point in time. Turn this into a truth. And you leave here excited. You don't leave here disconnected. I want you to turn this into a truth. I want you to do this with me. If, if you were prayed for for something that was visual and physical and it's still there, I want you right now with me to thank God. Just thank God right now. Thank you, Lord. You love me. And you have changed everything about me. And you're continuing to change everything about me. And you are making all things new. For one reason, Lord. Watch this. Do this with me. For one reason, Lord. Because you love me. And you proved it through your son. Father, redemption in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that blood tests change. I thank you there's no more symptoms or breakouts. There's no more herpes. There's no more genital warts. I thank you, Lord God, there's no more evidence of blood disease. I thank you when they get tests done that they're normal and negative all across this room in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close and leave the platform, but I want you to do one more thing for each other. If you still have some other kind of physical sickness in your